1973 saw the release of an album that for many opened a window into the past. For those who were there, it was a love letter to a time of rebellion and passion, music and belonging. For those who were discovering it for the first time, it was a glimpse of a way of life that had long since disappeared. The Who's Quadrophenia not only catalogued the details of mod culture in story form, but also opened the collective eyes of 1970s youth, through music and the subsequent film release, to a subculture that has managed to permeate through society and still exists in many forms today. Mod, through the eyes of Pete Townsend's Quadrophenia. Quadrophenia was the last big concept album. I don't think there's been anything much since then that's had the same impact. It, it gives voice to the, the voice of youth and rage. A great change was sweeping Britain in the 1970s. Styles, attitudes and politics were all undergoing natural or enforced alteration. And there seemed to be an underlying aggression fueled by the poor economic health of the country. Music was also seeing a major shift, reflecting the tensions within the nation, as well as embracing the new technologies that had been established in the late 1960s, that meant many bands or artists were forced to evolve or be left behind. As one of the country's longest surviving acts, The Who had slowly been enhancing and developing their sound during this period. By the time of the release of their sixth studio album, Quadrophenia, in October 1973, the lineup of Keith Moon, John Entwistle, Roger Daltrey, and chief songwriter Pete Townsend had amounted a strong back catalogue of hit songs and albums, including many conceptual pieces. Quadrophenia represented a pinnacle in the career of The Who. Having shot to international stadium rock status with their hit album Tommy, The Who appeared to have grown weary of their current direction and paused to reflect on their humble origins back on London's mod scene in the 1960s, bringing their story almost full circle. I think there have been several phases of mod. It's kind of a cyclical concept that seems to have been buried deep within British youth culture since probably the late 1950s, 57, 58. Um, I think the original mods, or moderns, or modernists, or call them what you will, started in the, probably in the Soho jazz boom, which was a reaction to trad jazz. There was a, a big modern jazz scene which grew out people like Ronnie Scott, Tubby Hayes, people like that, and that's what really started the mods off. Italian suits and uh, smoky jazz in Soho. And it was a very sophisticated youth cult. I mean, in, in, you know, I think if, if in, in some terms it might have been a reaction to the Teddy Boys. Because the Teddy Boys kind of made themselves known, you know, with the quiff and the, you know, their, you know, their uniform. It was a very outlandish uniform and you kind of, you know, the bootlace ties and the brogues and stuff, you know, you kind of spotted them straight away. Whereas I think that with mod, it was more about blending into society, that, you know, you created a world within a world and nobody knew about this world, it was completely secret. What it also coincided with was a kind of revolution in men's fashion. You know, you have to understand that fashion up until that point had been a women's only concern. Basically, certainly within the working class, um, men wore suits and at 16 a rite of passage would be to get your son a tailor-made suit. What Mod did was to kind of liberate the man from the tyranny of the suit and to take him into areas he'd never been into, you know, post-Second World War. People who were very important in that process were Cecil G, who was bringing in casual wear from Italy, you know, colourful jumpers, slacks, that kind of look. Or John Stephen, who had opened up on Carnaby Street. So he kind of, those forces kind of liberated men and created a new fashion, which mod was very easy to pick up on. The elite and secretive jazz-based mod scene of the late 50s soon evolved, as jazz interest was replaced with rhythm and blues that appealed to a wider audience of working-class youths. With the decline of, of the modern jazz as an influence in, in London anyway, the mods were around and they were looking for a new angle, and the new angle was rhythm and blues. Clubs started springing up to, to play this music. So you had La Discotheque, you had Flamingo, you had the Scene Club. Um, and then from there, bands started being formed. One of the first ones really was Georgie Fame 
and the Blue Flames. George Flames is very important in this process because he put together a band you know, which really um, was able to play this music with a lot of passion and authenticity. Uh, it's good dance music. It's jazz, it's not so easy to dance to. So one could see how this progression came. I think. The modernists of 58, 59 were a very small minority of the kids that went out in Soho. By 61, 63, things had changed quite a lot. Mods tended to move away from that sort of gut bucket, sort of Mississippi Delta sort of singing, even from Chicago blues, to sort of people, you know, sort of early Motown. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking of the things like Money by Barrett Strong and the sort of early records by the Miracles and the Velvetettes and people like that. And then, you know, on to, you know, the artists that, that came from the South, particularly, you know, groups like Booker T and the MGs. I think the Green Onions was, was seen as a kind of mod standard. And, I mean, it, it reached the point where somebody like Georgie Fame would risk being lynched if he didn't do it at the Flamingo. probably the third wave of mod, which is the slightly more populist. By this time, there's British bands playing in the film. There's the Kinks, you know, and the Who are used quite a lot. This was very much the third wave. The second wave of mods were into pretty much blues and R&B, and the third wave were into soul, Motown, and the British bands. From there, you had loads of bands forming who wanted to play blues and soul. If you look at the Rolling Stones, you look at the Beatles, you look at the Who, you look at the Kinks, you look at the Small Faces, all the bands that, you know, everybody wanted to play black music. This is why, you know, I think pop music was so great in the 60s, because the bedrock was firm, you know, the foundations were really firm. I think the main mod bands at the time, certainly the Kinks were the first, and then quite soon after that you had the High Numbers who became the Who, and then pretty much hot on their tails you had the small faces the action the eyes and then a whole host of much lesser bands I'd say the small faces the who and the kinks are the main three what are regarded today as mod bands Originally known as the Detours, they included the classic Who trio of Pete Townsend, Roger Daughtery and John Entwistle, along with Doug Sandham and Colin Dawson, who were to leave the lineup before the arrival of Keith Moon in 1964. They mostly played American blues and R&B, but unlike some of the other acts of the early 60s, the Who were not mods to begin with. It's one of the famous sayings, but it was always that the, the Who were a band who became mods, whereas the Small Faces were mods who became a band, and that's what the crucial difference was. The Who became mods for a guy called Pete Meaden, who started managing them in 64. They weren't writing their own material when Pete Meaden was... He never actually managed them. They had a, a, a guy who put up the money, and Pete Meaden was supposedly the publicist, but he was doing the day-to-day -day management. He gave them an image as a mod band and a direction, and as a result of that, they got a following, a very, very loyal mod following. And Meadon was a, you know, it was totally mod obsessed. You know, spoke this kind of fancy American lingo, you know, hip stuff, and took loads of speed and dressed in great suits and went to clubs every night. And it was him who turned Townsend onto mod. Him and Townsend blended like that. I think there was only really one mod in The Who, and that was Pete Townsend. I think Pete Townsend swallowed Meadon's philosophy of youth culture as art, as commodity, hook, line, and sinker. In his quest to mould the Who into a mod act, one of the first things that Peter Meaden did was to change their name to The High Numbers, a somewhat significant name in the mod scene. The High Numbers was the turning point because that name was actually reflective of mod culture. There was a sort of hierarchical system, if you like, and what a mod would aspire to from sort of being some sort of spotty schoolboy was to being what's called a face. 
um, which was somebody who kind of reinvented the, the sort of clothes you wore, the way you danced, you know, the, and your general cool, I suppose. But the band made a perfect mod package, if you like. Now, Maiden imparted this love of soul music to them, so they recorded Tamla Motown covers, James Brown covers, and Maiden wrote their first single, I'm the Face. And if you look at I'm the Face, you pretty much have Quadrophenia summed up uh, in that one record. The sound and subject matter of I'm the Face established the high numbers within the mod scene in 1964 and also summed up the essence of what was to be Quadrophenia and its main character, Jimmy Cooper. After a string of moderate hits, however, the relationship with Pete Meaden was to end and Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp were brought in to manage the band. Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp, who knew absolutely nothing about the business, but had loads of energy and drive and charisma and contacts in, not in music, they took, really, Pete Meaden's ideas and took them on. And Pete Meaden, a lot of the things that he'd started uh, were coming to fruition then, like these tours that he'd signed us up to. Oh, and the other manager guy. Uh, at bottom of the bill, the high numbers, bottom of the bill, these sort of tours where you get, in, you know, an old-fashioned tour where you get a big name and then you get sort of about eight other acts who do 15 minutes each or something with the bottom of the bill. But, but a couple of them, one was with the Beatles and the uh, another was the Kinks. And at the time, I think, that you really got me was in the charts and Pete was saying, I could do that. I remember we were backstage and, and Ray Davis was surrounded by these beautiful women and we were standing at the side like a couple of dumbbells and I think Pete's thinking, right, that's, I want some of that. So he wrote, um, I Can't Explain, which uh, was kind of a rip-off of uh, the kinks, You Really Got Me, the, you know, just the kind of the, the idea of that strong riff. By the time they got onto the second single, Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere, they'd actually moved on from sort of trying to sound like the kinks and actually developing something completely new. The instrumental section was just noise. It was, you know, it was actually sort of, it wasn't, it was fairly sort of random. It was supposed to emulate the effect of, of smashing up their instruments. But I think that the Who got away with it for the simple reason that they were loud. I mean, you know, ear bleedingly loud. If you hear it now, it's still contemporary and it's still shocking and it sounds wilder than anything done by the Prodigy or the Sex Pistols to me. Almost answered all his prayers and I often felt because before I'd gone to art school, I'd got into politics, were very young, kind of left-wing politics, CND and stuff, and I'd had a group of friends, and I had a group that I could, of people that I related to and socialised with. Pete never did. I don't think he did. I think he was looking for one. And when Mod come along, that's why I was quite surprised how much he just went for it. It's got, you know, it's, it's, it's got the rules, it's got the clothing. I mean, it's an unbelievably cool thing. And, he was just so happy to discover it, so pleased. It kind of fulfilled some, uh, some need in him, I think. It seemed as if Townsend had the knack of writing for the youth of the day, and this was no more apparent than in their anthem, My Generation, from the album of the same name, released in 1965. My Generation was adopted, I think, by mods. Maybe the stutter in My Generation, which is supposed to be from a blocked up speeding mod is, is a clue that it has got a, an affiliation to mod but uh, that's the peak of their association with the whole mod culture and they were wearing the clothes and they were doing the dances um, and they had the haircuts so they were it, totally immersed in it by then. Mm -hmm. 